Hi folks, it's good to be with you. I love to look everybody out there. Uh, this is uh, Jason, and my website is jasonbirdspreacher.com. Uh, where there's Bible teaching, preaching, apologetics on that website. Also, there's the Twitter, which is uh, Jason Burns Preacher uh, Twitter. Just type type in Jason Burns Preacher Twitter. There, there's a lot of apologetic material. And then, if you excuse me, type in uh, Facebook Jason Burns. There's lots of Bible teaching on my Facebook page. In this video, I want to make uh, a sidestep to make a, a, a political video, really, um, on an issue that I, I'm really concerned about. And uh, it, it's, it's basically, I'm, I am a Christian, for those who don't know, and I'm a born-again Christian who believes passionately in freedom of speech. I'm on record of defending, uh, making videos defending uh, uh, a black man called Sarah at Hyde Park who had death threats concerning his free speech. Um, Sarah uh, has a different religion than me. Uh, it's, I think it's Kemet religion. And he was criticising uh, Islam at Hyde Park. He was very, a very articulate debater. And uh, he got death threats. Uh, the the police told him that people were plotting to kill him. And I made videos standing up for his free speech. I've also uh, defended an atheist, a very famous atheist on the internet, who had his YouTube channel taken down called Sighten Atheist. And I made a video defending his free speech, and he got his uh, YouTube channel back up. Not, not because of me, but I was one of the first to, to stand up for this atheist, whose videos I don't agree with, but I, I stood up for his freedom to express his view. And so I've done that consistently. I've promoted free speech in Manchester. I've offered gay people to debate me. I've offered Muslim people to debate me. And I've given them my mic and said, here's my mic to a gay person and give them an opportunity to debate me. And so I promoted uh, free speech. I've defended free speech to people who, who disagree with me. And it concerns me that the freedom of speech is being eroded in our country. Now, I'm saying this from a Christian point of view, so I don't believe ultimately... Uh, politics is the answer. I believe until people are born again and changed, society won't fully change. That's what I believe. I believe also there's a spiritual battle in the heavenly realms and unless we're praying uh, and dealing with the spiritual battle, then ultimately the political battle will never be won. But, People, God can raise up people. Uh, God raised up uh, Cyrus, who was a secular person, to defend the rights of the Jewish people. And uh, God can raise up people in the secular realm uh, to stand up for freedom of religion. And so this video is being done to encourage people, uh, whether you're Christian or not, to stand up for free speech. So if you're an academic in a university, if you are a politician, if you are a magistrate, if you are a police officer, uh, if you are a teacher, a nurse, a doctor, uh, if you are the general public and you're concerned about the erosion of free speech, I would like to share my thoughts and opinions and I hope that what I share with you will galvanize you to action. For me, my job is to preach the gospel. I'm, I, I, I'm ordained, I'm called, I'm separated, I believe, to preach the word of God. I, to preach it in the streets and to preach it in, in the church. That's what God has called me to do. He's not called me to political activism. And I, I would like to do it, but I don't feel that's my calling. My calling is to preach the word of God. So while I preach the word of God, I'm handing you the baton, some people out there who are politically minded, who are astute, 
to do battle on this issue of freedom of speech. Maybe there are lawyers as well and, and solicitors and barristers who may listen to this and take on note what I'm saying and run with it. So, first of all, excuse me, um, I'd like to say history repeats itself. We've got to be vigilant that our freedom of speech can be taken away with them, from us without us realising. So we have to be vigilant. Excuse me. Just get a, a handkerchief. <coughs> Sorry about that. We have to realise that history repeats itself. One of the theologians that I've studied a lot over the years is a guy called Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, I've studied uh, Bonhoeffer a number of times over the years. Um, and uh, as you can see, this, this is a, a book about his life. And uh, Bonhoeffer was a theologian who who um, saw the rise of the Nazis early on in the early 1930s. He saw that the Nazis were rising to power. And he saw the dangers of this Nazism, that this Nazism was something fascist about it. And he perceived right early on that freedom of the German people and of Europe was in danger. So Bonhoeffer uh, wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And in that book, it was an exposition of the Sermon on the Mount. But what he was trying to do in that book is galvanize the German people to practical action. To say, well, you're not only a Christian uh, in the spiritual realm, but how is it going to work out in practice? Hey, by the way, we, we, you know, we've got fascism coming on along the line, and uh, what are we going to do about it as Christians? Are we going to speak out and say that this is wrong? So, so he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. He also saw that Nazism was encroaching in the church, and he began to galvanize the church, to stand against Hitler and a few of the pastors had to cut off from the mainline denominations and he started a theological seminary to train pastors and to get them away from the influence of Nazi, the Nazi regime and the Nazi, Nazi ideology. But in the end he, he lost his life, uh, he got involved with a plot to kill Hitler and Hitler discovered that plot and had Bonhoeffer executed. The point what I'm getting at is right early on Bonhoeffer could see the erosion of freedom and, and freedom of speech before many of the German people uh, realized that there was a serious problem with Nazism. And the German people didn't listen to Bonhoeffer when he wrote that book in the 1930s. He said, well, what has that got to do with today? Well, history repeats itself, and one feels that there are certain things that have been implemented in British society, certain laws, certain, uh, and certain movements, and certain, uh, certain ways of thinking, that are really prepared, have prepared, have prepared the ground, wittingly or unwittingly, for the loss of freedom of speech and to the movement of our so-called democracy into more of a fascist kind of regime, a fascist state. So I want to share those issues with you right now. 
on a simple local level, um, the government um, has implemented PSPO, which is Public Space Protection Order. Uh, this is a, a bylaw that local councils can have where they can criminalise people for whatever discretionary way they want. So, for example, if there's homelessness in a specific town centre, uh, public space protection order, a council can issue that order and get make sure that nobody in the town centre who is homeless can just uh, lie about on the street. And they can be fined and etc. Now, this might sound uh, like a good idea if you want to get uh, public space protection order against people who were drunks, who were drinking and just uh, causing a nuisance on the street. But this public space protection order has been uh, abused where councils are using it to stop freedom of speech, to stop preachers, to stop uh, religious people giving out literature and political, and also to stop people who were political from holding campaigns and giving their literature out. So that's one area, P public space protection order, okay? Then there are community dispersal orders and other uh, uh, kind of orders that have been implemented over the last few years to get rid of um, teenagers off who were causing trouble and, and antisocial behaviour. These community dispersal orders have also been uh, arbitrarily used uh, concerning um, have been arbitrarily used concerning um, uh, preaching and uh, political activism. So what was used to stop antisocial behaviour concerning youths is also being used, that these uh, dispersal orders are also being used as a political tool by the police and town councils to stop free speech. So what we're seeing here is we're moving into a police state where, where rather than have the freedom of speech, you're looking over your shoulder all the time. Uh, where the police want to look at your leaflets or they don't agree with the way you preach or the council don't agree with where you preach or the council don't agree with uh, groups uh, having their free speech and they can just get rid of them. Number three, um, councils have been um, been commercialised in the town centre so the town centres often give um, businesses the control of the town centre. That again stops people from having free speech on that public space because it now becomes a business rather than the town council. So these are just local little local things that are happening on a local scale. On a national scale, We have the rise of Antifa and Momentum. Um, Jacob Rees Mark, uh, an MP, Conservative MP, was at a, a university giving a talk, and Antifa and people of Momentum, uh, an activist group in the Labour Party, uh, went to confront Rees Mark. They wouldn't debate him, they wouldn't discuss with him, but they were very threatening, wearing masks, and quite aggressive. This kind of behaviour is being promoted, is being encouraged by some politicians. There's one politician uh, in the Labour Party who is uh, very high up and a close friend of Jeremy Corbyn, and um, has been on record that he agrees with this kind of behaviour. I find this very, very disturbing and very, very worrying. Rhys Mogg was very, the MP was very nice about it, but I think it was very, very disturbing. And it's very disturbing for this reason. In the time of Chairman Mao, when the Communists were rising, 
That's the kind of behaviour that the Communist Party, the Red Party did against Christians. They, they, they got these young Red Communists and they got them out and, and went round intimidating the Christians exactly like they did to Rhys Moyne. I find that very disturbing and it's a dangerous threat to free speech if it continues to grow and fester in our society. Um, the other thing as well is gay rights. The implementation of minority groups' rights as off-balance religious freedom and the, the government gave safeguards and said that uh, religious freedom would not be impacted by gay rights but it has and we're going to look at that in more detail in a minute. So the legalisation of gay marriage and the implementation of gay rights has eroded religious freedom the freedom of expression to express your religious views. You now cannot say, as a Christian, what you really think, that you believe from the Bible that, it's, that, that being gay is sin. You're not allowed to say that. That's a serious infringement on religious liberty. The other thing is the issue concerning language on university campuses and platforming and non-platforming. What that means is on university campuses, uh, student union uh, representatives will try to stop people having their free speech if they don't agree with what that representative speaker is speaking about. So for example, we've had the strange scenario of um, Jermaine Greer, who's a feminist, uh, stopped her free speech because there were students who were aggressive and would not allow her to have her, her freedom of speech and that <coughs> they call it non-platforming, that you don't have a platform to give your view. I find that very disturbing amongst university campuses in, in the UK. So those are just some issues I want to just read this to you this is uh, from Barnabas Fund it's a letter they sent out concerning the development of our freedom of religion in the UK freedom of worship was achieved in 1689 Number two, freedom to read scripture in public achieved in 1547. Three, freedom to interpret scripture without government interference achieved in 1559. Four, freedom to choose or change your faith or belief achieved in 1689. Freedom to preach and try to convince others of the truth of your beliefs achieved in 1812. And number seven, freedom from being required to affirm a particular worldview or set of beliefs in order to attain university or hold a public sector job or stand for election achieved in 1888. Over the last 500 years, the UK has led the world in establishing freedom of religion and spreading it to other countries. Yet today, freedom of religion is being significantly eroded in the UK. For example, in 2017, a Crown Prosecution Service lawyer claimed that publicly quoting parts of the King James Bible in modern Britain should be considered to be abusive and is a criminal matter. <coughs> 2016, a student had fled persecution in Africa, was thrown off a university social work course in the UK because of a Facebook post affirming traditional Christian view of marriage. 2015, the government proposal imposing government registration, inspecting of Sunday schools, something the UK abolished more than two centuries ago. 2015, a prominent Northern Ireland pastor was prosecuted for a sermon, also published online, in which he strongly rejected the Islamic doctrine that Jesus was a Muslim. 
the 2013 Nadia Uida, a Christian worker from British Airways, had to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights to win a six-year legal battle after being placed on unpaid leave for wearing a small cross round her neck at work. So here we see that from 1689 to 1888, freedom of religion was enshrined in law. And then from 2013 up to 2017, certain actions have been done that have actually taken away religious freedom. Now we're going to go into some detail. We've looked at history repeats itself. We've looked at some local issues and some national issues. Now I want to go into some detail. This is a booklet called Turn the Tide, Reclaiming Religious Freedom in the UK, Barnabas Fund, ourreligiousfreedom.org, ourreligiousfreedom.org. Another organisation that you can look at is Liberty. They do a good job in defending uh, freedom of speech. Liberty. The English church shall be free and shall have its rights undiminished and its liberties unimpaired. That's the first clause of Magna Carta 2015. Once we were free today, we are in chains. So once we were free, today we are in chains. On 6th of December 2017, Lord Pearson asked the government a critical question in the House of Lords. My Lords, Will the government therefore confirm unequivocally that a Christian who says that Jesus is the only son of the one true God cannot be arrested for hate crime or any other offence, however much it may offend a Muslim or anyone else in or any other religion? The government whip refused to comment. Such an equivocal response would have been unthinkable in an earlier generation. The UK led the world in developing freedom of religion and in spreading the idea of religious freedom across the globe. Today that heritage is being turned upside down. This is primarily due to attempt and impose an increasing intolerant secular humanism on Christians and churches. Anti-Christian prejudice, sometimes called Christophobia, is raising its ugly head. Over the last two decades, Parliament has begun to enact laws restricting religious freedom. Pre-existing laws have been misused by police and crime prosecution service, even claiming to quote from the King James Bible in public is a criminal matter. Wendell Phillips in 1811 to 1884, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. The New Test Act, most disturbingly in 2018, on the 100th anniversary of the year when for the first time all UK citizens were allowed to vote and stand for Parliament, there are moves to what is, in effect, the reintroduction of a test, reintroduction of a test Act to exclude committed Christians from holding certain public offices unless they deny aspects of their faith. In the run-up to June 2017 general election, some sections of the media were apparently attempting to out certain parliamentary candidates as unfit to hold public office because they held to public beliefs like miracles, traditional marriage, family values and the sanctity of life. The media also challenged senior Christian politicians with overtly theological questions, seemingly with intention of discrediting them. Candidates from other religions did not appear to be subjected to similar questions. So we had in the last general election, politicians who were Christians, i.e. The, the head of the Liberal Democrats for one, Mr. Farrer, who, under a storm of uh, media abuse, a witch hunt was conducted against him, purely on the basis that he was a Christian. That was an infringement upon his religious liberty and freedom of speech to be a Christian and to hold public office without abuse. Next, 
Christians in public life are increasingly facing threats and even violence because of their beliefs. Some of the violence is committed by individuals from minority groups which are themselves subject to hate crime. The government appears reluctant to tackle or even to acknowledge this Christophobia, alarming the timing of some violent alarmingly the timing of some violent incidents suggests that the violence may be marching in step with advocating action prom, action advocacy actions promoting the ideological agenda of particular groups by government bodies. So basically what you have is that there are various uh, ideological agendas by the government, i.e. gay rights for example, and any abuse towards Christians who don't uh, agree with the government agenda, if there is abuse, whether it be physical or mental, is not seen as serious as it would be to that minority group who are being persecuted physically or mentally. So there is a disproportionate policing and, and protection towards Christian free speech as opposed to minority right free speech. I have experienced it myself. I have been attacked by gay people and the government, the media, the politicians and uh, the police have done nothing about it. But at the same time, if I preach, uh, the police will investigate homophobic claims, even though I'm just uh, conducting my faith uh, concerning the Bible. So there is a disproportionate uh, balance concerning the freedom of speech of Christians as opposed to the freedom of speech of gay people in this country. I have experienced that personally from the police uh, on that issue. What does this happen? One reason is that we have forgotten our heritage. Britain was the first country in the world to develop human rights like freedom of religion, freedom of speech and freedom of the press. The very first clause of the Magna Carta includes the statement the English church shall be free and ends this freedom we shall observe ourselves and desire to be observed in good faith by us in perpetuity. From the 16th century onwards, Britain led the world in developing and establishing these freedoms and then spreading them to other countries around the globe. Now I want to say that I have defended freedom of speech. I've defended Sarah, a, uh, a black person who uh, is from a different religion than me, Kemetic religion. I stood up for his free speech. Uh, at Hyde Park I made videos concerning him. He had death threats and those death threats, uh, the police told him that people were uh, plotting to kill him. Uh, because he was criticising Islam and I stood up and made some videos defending his free speech. There was a famous atheist called Saiten Atheist and he uh, was um, uh, had YouTube take down his videos. I don't agree with his videos but he was a very famous atheist, very uh, uh, massive views for his work I did agree with his work, but I made a video standing up for his free speech. Uh, in terms of the gay community, a number of times I have promoted and encouraged uh, gay people to dialogue with me and I've even given them my mic so that they could have their free speech in order to uh, talk with me. So I've defended gay free speech, I've defended uh, different religious free speech and I've defended uh, secularist come atheist free speech. Um, but it says here, lamentably, a great many of our MPs and journalists have little or no knowledge of this great heritage of religious freedom. Sadly, this is also true of many Christians. In this book, we, we aim to correct that. Freedom of religion in the UK is under assault. This attack comes from an increasingly aggressive secularism that prioritizes the right of some groups over others. It, all, it, it comes from Islamism that grabs the advantage offered by political correctness while gradually seeking to align UK law with Sharia, which we'll look at. 
that's the other issue with our society. Our society is, on the one hand, aggressively secular, and on the other hand, is becoming uh, Islamicized. And the two pincer movements are having a massive effect upon the freedom of speech in our country. So, uh, the aggressive secularism, uh, they, they hijack government policies that are good just for the general public, but then use these public policies to suppress freedom of religion. So, for example, when the government was bringing in a, a policy to um, watch out for uh, Islamic terrorists, uh, the secularists tried to push for the, uh, the registration of Sunday schools, which is draconian because Sunday schools have nothing to do with Islamic terrorism. Then on the other hand, um, the Islamic terrorism is causing problems in our country because uh, government officials and people and, and police, uh, in order to seem fair, when they crack down on Islamic extremism, feel that they should have a heavy hand up towards Christians to show that they're equal with Muslims and Christians. And so that is having a derogatory effect on freedom of speech because many Christians are being targeted, i.e. street preachers, that have nothing to do with Islamic extremism and it's unfair. Church must not yield to pressure to incorporate other beliefs into the Christian gospel. It is essential that the church stands firm against any attempt to impose a government-approved, politically correct vision of Christianity. This is a challenge that the government has faced many times before. It is worth remembering the courageous stand taken by German church leaders in 1934 in the Brahman Declaration. They recognised that the churches which had incorporated aspects of their politically correct ideology of national socialism into their beliefs had, in effect, corrupted the gospel. Recommendation to Parliament, there should be a new Act of Parliament specifically affirming all seven aspects of freedom of religion which had developed in the UK over the last five centuries. Among other aspects, this should specifically state that no one holding or standing for public office should be required to hold particular religious and non-religious beliefs or face discrimination because they do not hold particular beliefs except there is a genuine occupational requirement such as chaplainly posts. But there is, it says here, the government should have reaffirmed the importance of freedom of religion in the UK's history and constitution and the UK's historic role in spreading freedom of religion around the world. Three, all secondary schools should teach the importance of historical emergence of freedom of religion in the UK, its development and spread around the world. Four, all government policies and proposed legislation should be subject to a freedom of religion impact assessment specifically to ensure that freedom of religion is protected. Where any new law or policies could harm freedom of religion, the government should ensure reasonable accommodation to safeguard freedom of religion. Publicly separate the world leading role in, in the UK has played over the last 500 years in the development of freedom of religion. But the government as a, an issue to develop political correctness and is beginning to try and develop uh, and push for scriptural interpretation of religious text. So in order to deal with Islamic extremism, there are some government departments and, and, and government officials that feel that they should have a method of interpretation of scripture to offset fundamentalism uh, they confuse the fundamentalism of Islam to the fundamentalism of Christianity. Uh, fundamentalism in Christianity means the core Christian doctrines. Fundamentalism in terms of Islam means the issue concerning uh, jihadi violence. So there are government officials who feel that they should impose on mosques a specific, specific religious interpretation of the text of the Quran. And so they're also, in order to be fair, trying to push it upon the church.
This is unconstitutional and is a direct attack upon freedom of religion and free speech. This booklet documents this, how the government has tried to do this. So now we'll look at seven case studies of the loss of free speech. Private prosecution service claim, claims quoting the King James Bible is a criminal matter. In February 2017, the CP lawyer told Bristol Magistrate Court that publicly quoting from the King James Bible in the context of modern British society must be considered to be abusive is a criminal matter. So basically, we have government officials saying that quoting the King James is illegal. The lawyer was speaking at the trial of two men arrested in 2016 for preaching in a Bristol shopping area. The police arrested the men not because of how they were preaching but because of what they were preaching. During the trial the CPS lawyer went on to claim to say to someone that Jesus is the only God is not a matter of truth to the extent that they are saying that the only way to God is through Jesus. That cannot be a truth. After the trial, the street preacher solicitor Michael Phillips expressed his concern at the actions of the CPS. This prosecution is nothing more than a modern day heresy trial dressed up under the Public Order Act. If the matter in which the men had been preaching had caused a problem, the police could have prosecuted them under the public nuisance laws, for example if their amplifier had been too loud and they had refused to turn it down. However, the preachers were arrested and then prosecuted for the content of their preaching even though everything they said was consistent with Orthodox Biblical Christianity down the ages. We know exactly what happened because one of the street preachers was wearing a body camera. This recorded what he and others preachers said and also what was said by some of the hecklers who were distributing the meeting from this recording. It appears that some of the crowd were deliberately trying to set up the preachers by asking them questions about Islam and homosexuality and then calling the police. Even though some of the hecklers were abusing and swearing at the preachers, the preachers were always respectful and never swore back. Nevertheless, the police choose to arrest the preachers, not the hecklers. The CPS lawyers claim that in modern Britain it is now a criminal matter to quote publicly from the King James Bible, in particular disturbing. The freedom to read the Bible in public was in fact one of the very first aspects of freedom of religion to be established in England in 1537. Henry VIII issued a royal decree specifically allowing this. King James Bible also had a unique status in English law as in 1611 it was given specific legal authorization to be read in public which is why it's sometimes called the authorized version although it is not quite certain how this was done in a letter to the Times in May 1881, the Lord Chancellor suggested it was almost certainly done by an order in council. The King James Bible has also had a massive impact on the development of the English language, perhaps even greater in the impact of Shakespeare. On the impact of Shakespeare, many everyday phrases were used such as to fall flat on his face and to put words in his mouth come directly from the King James Bible. What is at stake here is not a public prosecutor's ignorance of the historical significance of the Bible, but the fact that a lawyer representing the Crown Court could actually argue in court that public quote in the Bible should be a criminal offence. The two street preachers were later acquitted in an appeal to the Crown Court. However, the decision of both police and CPS to prosecute the men for the content of their preaching, the CP lawyers claim that it is illegal to publicly quote scripture represent a massive assault on freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Case Review 2 Case Study 2 uh, A government approved version of Christianity The English Church, quote, shall be free and shall have its rights undiminished and its liberties unimpaired so says the first clause of the Magna Carta, the Great Charter signed by King John 
the Barons of England on the 15th of June 215. Only four of the Magna Carta, 63 clauses have remained part of English law to this day, and this is one of them. An essential part of the freedom of the English Church is the freedom to interpret Scripture without the government imposing an interpretation that everyone has to accept. It was not until the reign of Elizabeth I, 1558 to 1603, that this was explicitly set out. Nevertheless, it has formed the bedrock of religious freedom in British history. We should therefore find it shocking in the 21st century when a government report proposes that the government should impose particular interpretations of scripture to ensure that they fit with the views of mainstream society. Yet this is by implication is what the Casey Review report does. The Casey Review was set up in 2015 under Dame Louise Casey to look at what the UK government should do about ethnic and religious minorities that had failed to integrate into wider society and were considered to pose a risk of being drawn into extremism and terrorism. Its report, the Casey Review, a view, review into opportunity and integration was published in December 2016. The report defined extremism of views at odds with the views of mainstream society. It gave examples from various religions including newer Christian churches and stated that all such instances undermine integration and should be challenged. Elsewhere, the Casey Review made clear that it considered such views to include traditional views of sexuality. Dame Louise recommended a new oath for holders of public office, indicating that this should express support for British values. Elsewhere in the report, she included support for LGB ideology as part of British values. Then, in itself, this in itself would be scandalous as it would be like reinstating the various test acts which were abolished between 1719 and 1871 as part of Britain's 400 year march of progress towards full freedom of religion. These test acts required anyone wanting to become a school teacher, magistrate, local council, MP or university student to publicly assent often, assent, often by swearing an oath to a particular set of beliefs. The law thus excluded non-conformist Christians and Roman Catholics from any of the above positions. The Casey Review went further in a section titled Regressive Attitudes. It divided the UK population into two groups. While many people in the UK appear to be seeing religion as increasingly less important, and in some cases are less of a force for good, for others religion is very important in their daily lives. Within this later group, there appear to be some who are keen to take religion backwards and away from 21st century British values on issues such as sexual orientation. The phrase taking religion backwards is particularly disturbing, and not just because of the level of prejudices it displays. The use of this pejorative term in the government report implies an intent attempt to impose a government-backed definition of modern British Christianity. The report described that 40% of Anglicans and 30% of Catholics with conservative biblical views on sexual ethics as those holding less progressive views towards sexuality, citing the British Social Attitudes Survey of 2013. The Casey Review stated that such views could also be found among older people and those with low educational qualifications. The Casey Review expressed the belief that there is a strong merit in creating modern British understanding of Islam and that the Quran should be interpreted for modern times and modern values. Given the Casey Review's repeated criticism of traditional Christian teachings, the question arises as to whether there is an implied suggestion that Christianity also should be updated and the Bible reinterpreted to conform with modern British attitudes, for example on sexual ethics. Perhaps the most generous comment that can be made about Dame Lewis' review is that she appears to have been handicapped by a lack of understanding of the importance of freedom of religion in British history, and therefore must be unaware of the threat to her suggestion and recommendations posed to liberties previous generations suffered great hardships to achieve. Only the most repressive and authoritative governments such as those in Belarus and China seek to impose a particular version of Christianity or state-approved interpretations of the scripture. 
The church must always be free to criticise government and society whether on morals, behaviour or indifference to the important issues of life like marriage and family. And the elderly and the marginalised, it is vitally important that the church speaks for the Bible, from the Bible rather than from any secular political ideology. But the government must never dare to impose a particular interpretation of scripture on the church. So the KC Review again shows the massive onslaught against religious freedom. The desire for the state to impose a, a, a scriptural interpretation of religious text. Number three, a government attempt to impose compulsory registration and Ofsted inspection of Sunday schools. In 1812, Parliament abolished the law which forbade meeting for non-Anglican worship and teaching within five miles of major towns. Since then, everyone is free to worship, hold Sunday schools and even build churches and chapels wherever they liked without any special restrictions. However, on 7th of October 2015, Prime Minister David Cameron announced the government was proposed that Christian Sunday schools, along with mosque schools, should be required to register with government and be subject to inspection by Ofsted, the government school inspectorate. Two weeks later, on 19th of October, the government published its counter-extremism strategy, which voiced concerns about supplementary schools, educational settings outside of the normal school hours. It suggested that those attending them may be at risk of being just uh, see what time it is. Sorry. It suggested that those attending them may be at risk of being presented with and believing twisted interpretations of the religion. Why did the Home Office, which published the counter extremism strategy, think it appropriate for the government to decide what are not appropriate interpretations of any religion. On the 26th of November 2015, the Department for Education released a 15-page proposal for the compulsory registration and inspection of supplementary schools. This suggested that there were an organisation which pro was providing at least six to eight hours per week of teaching. It should face compulsory government registration and inspection. Hence a local church running a Sunday school two hours per week and a couple of children's clubs for, for different ages two times two hours per week or youth club two to three hours per week will require government registration and Ofsted inspection. The government could only enforce these proposed regulations if it knew which churches were running Sunday schools and children's clubs. Therefore in practice it would have to make it compulsory for Sunday schools to register even if they were not teaching for six or more hours per week. In fact, the first 14 questions of the government's constitution consultation on these proposals were essentially an attempt to obtain information about where supplementary schools existed, the number of children attending and where they were taught. The government proposal also listed five prohibition prohibited actions for all supplementary schools, including Christian Sunday schools, some of these, like not accommodating children in unsafe premises, were perfectly reasonable. However, one of them is undesirable teaching. The report does not define this ambiguous term. It merely illustrates by saying, for example, teaching which undermines or is an incompatible with fundamental British values or which promotes extremist views. However, when viewed alongside attempts by secular humanists to hijack British values, this is concerning. The elephant in the room which no one wants to talk about is Islam. In order to avoid stigmatising Muslims as a group, the report refused to acknowledge a problem in some Islamic supp uh, supplementary schools. Instead it decided to impose restrictions and inspection on all religions. This will simply mean that more resources are required to identify where there are genuine problems. More importantly, requiring Sunday schools to be registered and inspected by the government turns the clock back on religious freedom by more than two centuries. Number four, freedom to change one's beliefs and convert to one's faith. In 1689, the Toleration Act became law, 
This allowed people to follow whichever faith they chose. The freedom to change one's beliefs and convert to another religion is one of the essential aspects of freedom of religion. Prosecution, persecution of converts in the UK. Many British adults raised in other religions who freely choose to become Christians have been subjected to extraordinary levels of abuse including physical violence. This is particularly true of Christian converts from Islam. Very few are accepted by their families and most experience emotional abuse and are penalised in various ways such as being prevented from attending college, thrown out of the family home and no longer treated as a son, daughter or spouse. Many are physically abused and some are being locked in rooms or garages for days, weeks or even months to try to force them to return to Islam. Others have been tricked into travelling to countries like Pakistan and forced to marry a Muslim once they arrive. In such countries their life is greatly at risk as relatives may murder them to restore the family honour or in obedience to Islam law, Sharia, that requires the execution of any adult male who leaves Islam. Nasser Hussein and his family have suffered violent persecution from local Muslims in Bradford because they left Islam and became Christians. There it is. This is a scandal in our midst. Religious persecution is happening right under our noses in the UK. Many Christians who have converted from Islam are silent about the suffering for fear that speaking out will make things worse. Yet the police, CPS and Home Office behave as if the problem does not exist. They ignore even formal complaints or treat them as cultural matter. The unspoken implication of labelling the matter as culturally usually seems to be that nothing should be done about it. Nissa and Kerbra, the two people, Nissa Hussein and his wife Kerbra were brought up as Muslims but converted to Christianity about two decades ago. Since then Muslims have attacked their house in Bradford many times, damaged their car and severely beaten Nissa. On one occasion he had to be hospitalised after four men armed with a pickaxe handle attacked him outside his home. Both Nissa and Kerber were falsely accused by members of the local Muslim community resulting in each of them spending many hours in detention at police station. In June 2016, he wrote to his local MP, summarising the attack and abuse he and his family had endured, as well as police inaction. He writes, We were forced to add, this is the ex-Muslim who became a Christian, this is what he says, We were forced out of our previous home after several years of suffering as converts. And in short, my family, I endured hell by my fellow Pakistani young men in the form of persecution which entailed assault daily intimidation. Criminal damage to property, smashing house windows, also three vehicles written off whilst the community looked on and even endorsed this. One of the vehicles was torched outside my home despite witnessing another vehicle being rammed deliberately by a man who I knew. The police did not even take a statement, never mind an arrest. Finally, after being threatened to be burnt out of my home, these young men deliberately set the neighbour's house which was vacant on fire in the hope that our house would catch fire. When I reported it to the police prior to this happening, the police sergeant response was stop trying to be a crusader and move out. In short, the police had willfully failed us so as not to be labelled racist or seen to cause the Muslim community offence at our suffering and expense. After being forced to move out in June 2006, we settled in St Paul's Road and set about rebuilding our lives which was going well and had no issue and forged good relations with neighbours until we contributed in a dispatch documentary called Unholy War, highlighting the plight of converts from Islam to Christianity in September 2008. Then our problems began, largely posed by the A family who had been engaged on a campaign to drive us out of our home given their bigoted attitude and thoroughly unscrupulous conduct. And since last July they have embarked upon a criminal damage to my vehicle to the point I have now had my vehicle windscreen smashed for fourth occasion. The most recent incident occurred on the 24th of April when I had my vehicle smashed in the early hours of the morning and can express, cannot express the financial impact also as I have to wait three weeks at a time for the glass to be ordered from the states as my vehicle is American. And again, as in our previous experience, the Pakistani community has looked on 
are not suffering and turned a blind eye whilst others have been openly hostile why they enjoy freedom and liberty religious or otherwise whilst imposing their will rule and reign upon us and we are treated as second class citizens as a result of the latest criminal damage and after weeks of having no car until it was repaired i took the liberty of parking my vehicle away from outside my home for peace of mind as given the misery over the last several years I have been diagnosed with PTSD and my wife and family also suffer stress and anxiety. When I went this morning to get my car I was mortified to discover that my car had been smashed deliberately yet again. Clearly we cannot go on living like this. Our lives have been sabotaged. We fear for our safety and suffer anxiety daily not to mention the financial cost to all of this wanted criminal damage. I cannot express in words the police failure over the years which has led to our suffering and have no confidence in them whatsoever and I'm desperate for your help. Only when the local press published Nazar's story did the police start to take his family situation seriously. In November 2016, Nisa Cobra and their children were removed out of Bradford under armed police protection to a new home they had brought bought in another part of the country. Despite media reports of attacks such as those on Nyssa, the Home Office still refused even to acknowledge the problem. On 21st of July 2016, the Home Office published a hate crime action plan. This included a single mention of anti-Christian hate crime. The first time the government had recognised such a phenomenon but totally ignored the widespread problem of abuse suffered by Christian converts from Islam, such as Nisa. Ironically, the publication of the Hikap was overshadowed by the day's news of the brutal murder of a priest by Islamists while he was leading a service in his church in France. In his submission to a subsequent Home Affairs Select Committee inquiry in 2016, Barnabas Fund noted that there were broadly three types of anti-Christian hate crime in the UK. Hate crime arising from general contempt of Christians held by some elements in society, such as attacks on clergy, vandalism, specifically targeting churches. Threats and sometimes actual acts of violence carried out against Christians and Christian property by LGBT rights extremists. For example, the owners of the Ashkers Bakery in Belfast received both death and arson threats and suffered serious damage to their property during a recent court case related to whether they would be compelled to be a cake, bake a cake promoting the redefinition of marriage, attempts at forced reconversion back to Islam and the, submi the submission observed that we are concerned that political correctness and the fear of raising concerns about hate crime against Christians by a small minority within groups which are